Welcome to Rcast, the official podcast of the Rchain Cooperative. Rchain is a complete, concurrent blockchain platform designed for maximum efficiency at minimal computational and environmental costs by utilizing proof of stake. Beyond our platform, our investment partners, Reflective Ventures and Pythia, fund organizations that are working within our core mission statement to create a better world by enabling social coordination in robust, secure, and scalable ways. I'm Derek Barris, the Director of Content for Archain. Each week on Rcast, I'll be talking with the founders of our portfolio companies, as well as co-op members, staff, and other figures in the Archain ecosystem about the most pressing issues in blockchain today. Please check out rchain.coop to learn more about the platform, our community, our validator sale, and information on becoming a member. I began my journalism career in 1993 at Rutgers University. For four years, I wrote for all the various school newspapers, but for two of those years, I was the religion columnist for the Delhi Targum, being that my major was actually in religious studies. And one thing you learn about writing about religion is that you can't get too invested in any one of them if you want to be able to present all of them in a fair light. Now, it helps that I'm not actually religious, so I don't think that one is better than the other, so I was able to look at all of them on the grounds by which they were presented. And that was really the goal of journalism in general. When I did take classes, you were taught to look objectively at all of the varying facets of a story and try to piece together what you knew to be the best possible narrative, the facts, the truth of the situation. Now, of course, truth is always subjective in certain regards. We always take our history and color our present because of our experiences. Yet at the same time, what you learn early on, if you've ever taken a debate class, is that you need to be able to debate not only what you believe, but take the exact opposite side of what you're debating against and argue that with equal validity. Now back then, that was a challenge. It probably always has been a challenge. But one that teaches you to look at many sides. And if you're paying attention at all to our media today, you know that's not the case. I've been in journalism for 25 years. I've watched it move from that desire to understand all sides to the idea that what you feel to be true should be represented as the truth. Now, I love the internet. I grew up the son of a computer programmer. I've spent my entire life on computers. I love the way that we connect. I love the way that I can speak into this microphone right now and you, wherever you happen to be, can hear it and hopefully enjoy these conversations that I have on this podcast because I think they're important. And today's is especially important to me because it has to do with truth in journalism or trying to combat fake news. Now that's a term that's been deployed in ways that I think is deplorable because it doesn't actually represent the integrity that many journalists are trying to do their job with today. It's dangerous. And that's why Proof Media exists. Today's my guest is Chris Young. Chris happens to be a professor in the Department of Management and Global Business at my alma mater, Rutgers University. He was also the co-founder of Proof with Luigi DeMeo, who is a very active member of our chain, and I always enjoy talking to him as well. And these guys are doing very important work. Proof uses the wisdom of the crowds to try to source information that is true. When I told Chris that I thought of what they're doing as a cross between Snopes and Wikipedia, he agreed with some reservation, as you'll hear, but also said it's also part marketplace. And that's actually very important, this tokenization of truth. So far, they've gamified their platform in certain ways. You'll hear me talk about the Kavanaugh trial as one example in our conversation. And Chris feels that if you don't incentivize truth, people will take advantage of it. They'll take it for granted. If you're not putting any skin in the game, as a popular sentiment now goes, 
then you're not as likely to really do the research to understand the truth. And this happens on an individual level and it happens on a collective level. We have to strive to be better. If you live in a democracy, you might not always agree with your representation. And that's why we have voting. That's why it's so important. I'm recording this just two weeks away from our next election day. And I've been reading some disturbing articles about people who are saying they're just not voting because they don't think that it matters. And that's crazy. Next week's podcast will actually be with two new portfolio companies here at Archain, Govern and NetVote. And we'll be talking about this very topic. But that marketplace idea that Chris mentions about incentivizing the desire for truth is very much how this whole blockchain experience and the cryptocurrency ecosystem that's developing is going to function. And that's a good thing. If we need reasons to be honest and the financial backing is one of those, then so be it if we strive for something better. We talk a bit about why this platform is being created on blockchain and why it's the perfect vehicle, that immutable ledger that exists so we can look back at it. Now, of course, that doesn't make a huge difference in today's social media environment, but we got to try. And that's exactly what I talk to Chris about. That desire to be something better. Being a fellow Rutgers alumni, I see that you are on the uh, Institute for Ethical Leadership and a lot of your work, uh, both in legal circles and in academia, seem to revolve around ethics. So I'm guessing this played a role in the creation of proof. Yeah, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, there's a little bit of a no in there. So let me explain. Um, in 2009, uh, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on disinformation that happens in religious organizations. And that made me start thinking that there's a need for a global arbitrator of, of news or of information. And that kind of sat dormant from 2009 through about 2016 or so. And then Luigi and I started talking about doing something interesting that had an ethical content. Let me take that back. Luigi and I started talking about coming up with a solution that solved a societal problem. And taking some of my ideas from 2009, coupled with Luigi's ideas using market structure and market, uh, using the market to help identify false or misleading content, we, we, we came up with the idea of proof. So yes, it, it has a lot of ethical connotations with it. It comes, comes mainly from uh, my past research uh, around disinformation. I also wrote a couple articles on disinformation, particularly focused on governments and, the, and their use of propaganda. So all of these things led to, to, to Luigi and I, our discussion, and he added a tremendous amount to the discussion with respect to, you know, using the market to, uh, to become that global arbitrator and uh, using the wisdom of crowds, which is a theory that him and I spoke about since 2008 when he was a student in my uh, economics course. One of the things I'm doing with this podcast is, and in general with our chain with content, is there are a lot of macro ideas about what blockchain can solve and a lot of big ideas about like, we'll solve climate change or we'll help with that and your, your truth in journalism. But can you tell me exactly the mechanisms by which proof works and how it will combat fake news and false information? Let's see the, the easiest way to explain this. So if, if an individual, so what we are using is, is what's historically referred to as the wisdom of crowds. The wisdom of crowds is an economic theory that started a long time ago, hundreds of years ago by Sir Richard Dalton. He stumbled across this idea. And it's been, this, this theory and idea has been tested by numerous people, uh, numerous generations, and in different subject areas from economics and sociology to, uh, to medicine and, and psychology, amongst other areas. But what this theory says is that when a, when a group of people are properly incentivized and disincentivized to get an answer right in a blind fashion, meaning each other cannot talk with, you cannot talk with each other and you won't know uh, what the general consensus is saying about a particular question. 
if those if those parameters, those are the very basic parameters, if they're pushed upon a market or a group of people to make a decision, we know that 90 plus percent of the time, the median of that group, the median answer of that, or I'm sorry, the average answer of that group um, will be better than any one group, any one person over time. And that also includes the elites who have insider information. So, so that's the basic premise, or that's the basic uh, idea underlying, underlying proof. Now, I guess the question is, how, how does it work? Well, it's sort of a simple idea when you peel back all the details around the science, and it goes something like this. If you are reading an article and you identify that something about the article just doesn't sit right with you, you're not sure if the facts are right, you're not sure if the premise of the article is correct, but like most people, we don't have time to spend to, to research the article and to identify uh, if, in fact, something is right or wrong. What you do is you take that story, the URL of that story, and you send it to Proof. Proof then takes that URL and sends a message to hopefully thousands of voters throughout the world who will then read the article, perform research on the article, and stick a vote, or they'll put a vote, monetary value, on the article as mostly true or mostly false. It's done in a blind fashion, blind manner, where there's no collusion amongst the voters. After it goes through a series of, of tests on the back end, the vote will close, and the vote will identify the article as mostly true or mostly false, and will give you a percentage. 75% of the population says this is mostly true, or 95% says it's mostly true. And based upon the outcome of the article, true or false, the winners are paid. And the winners are paid what we refer to as proofs. And proofs are, uh, are, are tokens of some sort, not the same type of token you would think though as a crypto, but it's a token. And they can use those tokens to, to vote again, or they can use those tokens and sell them back to the house to get some money. Now, right now you have on your website, and I'm planning on taking it after we chat, the, the Kavanaugh trial, a test about that. Why did you choose that as a, as a, to focus on right now? Yeah, so, so obviously Kavanaugh is a hot topic. There's, there's, there's a fair amount of information that's out there, not validated by any one source. And if the wisdom of crowds holds true, and it is important, though, we've got we to gotta decipher our games from our actual product because they're not the same. But what we're, what we're hoping is that the game can tell us if what the outcome of that uh, of the facts might be about that case. Are, are some of these allegations true, mostly true, or mostly false? And let's see what the population has to say. Now, the thing about the game, which is, which is interesting and it's different from our platform, is we do not provide incentive. We do, we there's no disincentive here. So, meaning people can't lose anything. And when somebody can't lose anything, we're, we're, we're very skeptical of the outcome. But we play the games mainly so we let people uh, identify how proof will work in a, in a very micro in a very micro way when we uh, launch the product in uh, December January timeframe. So the gamified version is just more of an introduction. I, I saw you did a, a live version at a my old campus Livingston recently, but that will not be how it operates once you actually launch. Um, that's that's true. So you know the, the game was was built. Uh, mainly as a marketing tool to help people identify with our with our voting mechanism, and to to show people how it will work on the platform, and and to show them how easy it will be um, to work on the platform. Because in our early research, uh, we heard we heard a fair amount of of our research respondents says said, well, it seemed complicated. And and then we showed them the game. We we went out and we we performed research on fifteen hundred people across the United States. And, and we showed them exactly how the game worked. You know, you, 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 you stake a proof or you allocate so many proofs, you identify if an article is mostly true or mostly false, and you submit your vote. And once the vote closes, we tell you if you're on the winning side or the losing side of that vote, and you are paid a monetary value of proofs back into your wallet. So the game was meant just to show people how this will work when we launch. Now, see, uh, the, 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 what's, what's, what's wrong about the game or different about the game from our product is we let people play the game without putting up any stake or without putting up any proofs or without putting up any monetary value whatsoever. So there's no disincentive if, they, if they're wrong. So, so we know the outcomes in the game are not going to be as accurate as the outcome uh, when, the, when the actual product is launched. 
Right. So that's what I was going to ask, because in a sense, Facebook and Reddit operate under similar principles, just in the in the terms of if you like or upvote something, it will get to more people and the algorithms work that way. But obviously that has nothing to do with truth that feeds into our tribalism and all of the political problems we are seeing because you're in an echo chamber. So the, 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 token, the tokenization is really what you're saying is the incentivization for people to actually research and discuss what is true. Yeah. So, so there's a couple things different um, than, than, a, than a Facebook with, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, like, dislike, in, in a sense that that's, that's not blind. Right. So if I, if I send around an article to people on the same side of the aisle as me and say, hey, you know, I'll read this article. Of course, you're going to be an echo chamber and everybody's going to say, you know, vote the same way on an article. Um, but that's because everybody can see it. There's also a, there's also another problem with that is if you vote, you don't lose anything. Right. Mm-hmm. There's no uh, there's no downside and there's no upside. Right. So if you if you were to vote thumbs up and, you know, let's just say you said thumbs up and five other people said thumbs up. But. 5,000 people said thumbs down, you would be on the losing side of that bet. Hmm. That is, the, that is a, a major difference. So, I, so there's really three things that are, are very important here, right? One is it has to be blind. Two, there has to be an incentive. And three, there has to be a disincentive. Now, that's just a three amongst other, other parameters that have to be on the platform. But those three by themselves dramatically change the way anybody else is looking at fake news. Now, you have three roles uh, that people can funnel into your platform, which are submitters, readers, and voters. Can you tell me how you decided to choose those three and what their functions are? Sure, sure. So a submitter is anybody that finds an article on the internet. Um, at some point in the future, it'll also include video. But right now, it's text only. So if you read an article on the internet and you're not certain of the, uh, the validity of the content, uh, or maybe you are certain of the validity of the content. You, you, you know it's a really good article and you want it voted because you want other people to believe it. That submitter sends that article to proof. So that's the role or the persona of a submitter. Um, the, let's, let's go to the, the voter second because that is one that also has a call to action. Uh, a voter is somebody who has to register on the site. Unlike a submitter, a submitter does not have to register. A voter, a voter has to register on the site a voter is also somebody that goes through a KYC process. We have to identify that the person who is registering, registering is, is in fact that person. We will not allow people to have multiple personas or multiple registrations on the site, but mainly for the reason of collusion. So, so a voter has to um, register, go through a KYC process, and they have to put up a monetary stake, which means they have to buy proofs from us. They can then use those proofs to vote, as, uh, as we talked about previously. The last, the, the, the last uh, person is a reader, and a reader does not have to uh, register on the site either. They come into the, into the product and just uh, browse the product or read the articles or, or, or look for false content or look for accurate content as much as they want. They can search on you know, various parameters like you would on any other search engine, although obviously we're not a search engine. But they'll have the ability to, to query any of the content that is in the archive. They can search on a journal, journal, journalist, and other, and other standard parameters. Those are, the, those are the three personas that are on the site at the moment. So from a macro perspective, it feels like it's a cross between Snopes and Wikipedia, just to give some context. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I think, I think we, we spend a fair amount of time looking at Snopes. We, we love what the folks over at Snopes are doing. So, so yes, the folk, uh, Snopes is a fact-checking uh, service. At least we think the downside to Snopes are one of their challenges. The fact that it's, it's hard to scale, right? Because you need, you need certain bodies, you need certain people to review one, two, three articles a day. And they're not addressing, you know, the 17,000 articles that are published across the internet on a daily basis. So, so, so that's a little bit of a challenge with Snopes. Although the work they do, we think is, 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 is very strong. On the Wikipedia side, yeah, we, we, we look at Wikipedia uh, in a similar way. Downside to Wikipedia is, uh, when people are putting up content, they're not putting it up in a blind fashion. They're putting, in the, putting it up and letting everybody, everybody see the content. And there's no incentive or disincentive to put up high-quality content or stuff that's, that's necessarily been fact-checked by others. So there's a, fair lot of, there's, there's a fair amount of noise that goes over Wikipedia, though we, uh, we identify that as a great service to, uh, to humanity. 
Oh, I remember I, I do some editing in Wikipedia, definitely not a top contributor, just a few things, but I remember changing cocoa to cacao once in an article contextually, and I think it was changed within five minutes. Uh, so <laughs> some people take it very seriously. Yeah, they do. They do. But, but, but you're right. I mean, I actually look at us as uh, probably the combination of, if we wanted to play that game, a combination of a Snopes, a Wikipedia and a, a marketplace, mm. you know, a, a, any type of marketplace where a blind vote is used. Not obviously a stock market because that's not blind, not even a predictive market because that's not blind. But if you wanted to think about it in a predictive market sense, which I tend to do from time to time, is to think about a, a, a blind predictive market. This comes out of, I don't know if you've read the book uh, by Jim Surowiecki, The Wisdom of Crowds. He references some of those things and some of these ideas of blind votes and blind crowds in his book that uh, I read many years ago. Great. I have not, but I'm writing it down right now. Now, how do you think, how did you come into deciding to launch this platform on blockchain? So we recognized that it's going to be a contentious platform in many respects. Right? There's going to be a fair amount of people that love the outcomes of the articles. But there's going to be a fair amount of people that dislike uh, the outcome of an article. If you are a, an individual that gets paid for disinformation, and we know there's a fair amount of those, those, uh, those actors out there, uh, and we can identify if that we can we can identify the content that you're publishing as factually incorrect. You might have now an incentive to either hack the system, change the article, manipulate the system, collude on the platform. So so what we did is we 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 thought that we needed an immutable record. You know, speaking with Luigi, he was spending a lot of time in blockchain at the you know when we first launched. We thought that the auditability of the blockchain is extremely important letting people at any point go back in history and to see uh, if that, that is in fact none of the none of the outcomes of the articles were were manipulated or changed. And we think that can only be done on the blockchain uh, from a from an efficiency perspective and audibility perspective. And how did you get involved with the R chain ecosystem? Uh, that's a great question. So we were originally looking at uh, Ethereum and and launching on that platform but we also realized that the transactions, you know, if we if we get any real if we get any real volume on our platform, which obviously we hope to to be the case, but if you have a couple thousand articles, let's assume it's really successful. If you have a couple thousand articles coming over your platform, or even a couple hundred articles coming over your platform, and and just assume there's north of 20 people per per article voting on this, the transaction volume is pretty high, and and we were we were worried. That Ethereum would be clogged, and uh, the transactions would not go through in a timely manner. We learned about our chain, and we learned about the scalability of our chain, and we really liked the idea. We had the opportunity to meet the folks over at our chain, and the folks at Reflective Ventures, and we were sold on the idea. Despite when we moved down the path with Reflective, the uh, our chain nodes weren't live, but we were sold on the technology. And so when you launch, you said you plan for December or January, but we're a little further out with mainnet and looking in March now. Are you going to launch on Ethereum and then transfer, or is there another platform you're, you're doing your, your beta on? Yeah, so we're, we're going to do our, uh, our alpha release uh, not on the R-Chain. So our alpha release is, uh, at least this is the last, the last thinking of, uh, of the tech team. We're probably going to launch it on a server just so people understand exactly how it works. And when we launch our alpha, it's important that we have to we communicate this clearly to everybody. We are not asking people to put up a stake. This is just to show people exactly how the platform will work. Uh, this will be a very this will be a very small sub segment of our people that are already interested in proof that we're going to invite to our alpha, and we want to we're really going to test the alpha uh, pretty hard all the way up until uh, our chain is ready. Uh, remove all the kinks, all the bugs. So our first our first launch will be on a proprietary server or servers um, with ultimate goal of, of mapping over to our chain of people.